Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined uh, again. We, we had a, for our first conversation in the spring of 2021, which stands up very well, I might add. Uh, very, joined again by James Carville, my friend. I think we first met when James was running the Clinton campaign in 92 and crushing us who were in, in the Bush, first Bush White House. So, but I've, I, I'm, I'm letting those bygones be bygones, you know, three decades <laughs> later, I can, I can get over that. And uh, James, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, good to uh, be here. And James is really, I think, apart from running campaigns all over the place and is a very shrewd analyst and an honest analyst of American politics. And uh, so I really look forward to finding out from you what the situation is, what the balance of power in the country is, and then we can talk about each party, what you expect from the Republicans, what you expect uh, and wish for from the Democrats. So state of play, November election. We're now two months past that. It's January 9th as we speak, just past the speaker election. What's the sort of balance of power, the balance of forces in American politics? Well, I mean, the, the Democrats do control the White House and, and the Senate, and have had a, in, of course, narrowly lost the House. I think Biden didn't do anything else in his last two years. He would be successful by what he got done in his first two years. So uh, I'm not, I, I think everybody would breathe a sigh of relief if we just got uh, through the debt ceiling and, and closing the government down. And, and if, if that happened, I think people would say, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> I'm not right. sure well, that's going to happen that easily, but uh you know, it's it could have. Let me put it this way: it could have been a lot worse. And remember, they're getting ready to pick up another seat because that Virginia's them a special for a deceased member in Virginia. That's a Democratic district. And if George Santos doesn't hold up, um, the Democrats would probably win that seat. And if if they reran it, so there's some chance that the majority shrinks even more. Right. But in terms of the election, I mean, 2020 and 2022 together, uh, I mean, it feels like we dodged a bullet. On the other hand, the country is evenly divided, right? Yeah, I, I, I call them micro interventions. All right. They, and, you know, we won the presidency in 2020. We did not do that well in the House and, you know, in, in other places. In 2022, uh, you know who really won? You know, I'm being honest here. I'm not saying this from here, but who really won? The 2022 election, I said one, who really starved off a disaster or like the people I'm speaking to right now. Now, why do I say that? I say that because Democratic base turnout was not very good. They won't tell you this on MSNBC, but it was the lowest in Georgia that the black turn share, the black percent of the vote in Georgia was the lowest it had been since 2006. It should be 20 and a half in North Carolina. It was 17. It was really, uh, check with Charlie Sykes, but they really underperformed turnout in, even in Milwaukee. So, it, and there were more Republicans than Democrats that actually voted. If you were looking at the makeup of the electorate, you would say the Democrats are going to get, they're going to get beat bad. And that didn't mm -hmm. happen. Why? Because about seven to 8% of Republicans voted Democratic. 2% of Democrats voted Republican. And independents broke pretty decently for Democrats at the end of the election, which never happens to the incumbent party. I'm, I say never. I, I, I can't remember. But it's, right. if it does, it's a, it's a very rare event. And that was a lot of people saying, well, I'm not really, I don't know what I am, but no, I'm not a Democrat, but I can't take this anymore. I'm just going to vote Democratic for now. And I, I think that's, that was the margin uh, that kept us in, you know, we won in places like Pennsylvania and Arizona and Georgia. But I think that kept the House losses to something, you know, pretty disappointing for the Republican side. And and I'm, I'm pretty sure the data backs me up on this. Yeah, no, that's consistent with what I've seen too. But I, and, I, and I, you know, we were involved a little bit in persuading, hopefully, some of those independents and uh, weak Republicans, so to speak, to vote Democratic at least this once. But when you step back and say, what's the division of power in the country? It's really pretty close to 50 50 going forward, right? If you look at 20, if you think about 2024, I mean, Georgia, Arizona, yeah. uh, really oh. Nevada, even on a knife's edge, maybe Michigan, Pennsylvania a little better, but Wisconsin, Ron Johnson won. I mean, it, I am struck that. The Democrats picked the only single person in Wisconsin that couldn't beat Ron Johnson. 
they could have yeah. dished up. I mean, really, that was a that was an effort here to, to come up with the one guy that couldn't beat him. So, Do you, how worried? I mean, the going. I guess where is the balance between we defeated the worst uh, election deniers, the the most the craziest conspiracy theorists, which is true, I think, though Arizona was awfully close. But going forward, it's a pretty. I mean, what do you think the odds for if you just had to say twenty twenty four presidential odds, Democrat Republican? What do you think? Fifty fifty, a little better than that for Democrats. Uh, but did Yogi Berra say predictions are very hard to make, especially about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. right. Uh, the, first of all, the maybe not the short term, but the immediate term and long term perspectives for the Democratic Party is quite good. I mean, the young people voted in 18, they voted in 20, they voted in 2022. I mean, didn't vote as much as older people, but as a, as a shared electorate, it was pretty darn good. That, that's probably another underappreciated story about holding the losses to a s- small extent in 2022. And, and, you know, it's just a fact of life that they're going to lose some of their old people and Young people are going to keep coming up through the system. That's the kind of inevitability of life and the inevitability of American politics. So much of it depends. You know, you know, obviously, if Biden runs, the Democrats are going to renominate him because Biden is well liked among Democrats, and Democrats think that Biden's done a good job. But he's got to consider the age issue. It, it could because everybody else considers it. I'm 78. I'm like. I think I could do this job seven years from now. Couldn't do it. Couldn't have done it seven years ago. But it, it, it and it's something that he's going to have to deal with. And it's not a a gotcha question. It's not a failure to focus on the real issues and you know talk about jobs and health care or whatever it is. And that's got to play into his decision. So now on the Republican side. First of all, I said, I think it was on Morning Joe, that, that Trump is a gone pecan. That's the slang down here for he's done. You'd be surprised the pushback that I got from non-Trumpites. Mm-hmm. Oh, you can't say that, James. You, are, you, you know, you, 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 look, look, and of course they mastered something where they had him call the House floor to try to get, get two votes. That's about what he's down to. Uh, Matt Rosendale would even take his call. And he is done. <clears throat> After all this obsession of all these years of him occupying the front part of your mind, when you think about it, you just wonder how fast it's going to be before he goes to jail. He is not going to be the Republican nominee at all. Now, I'm not I'm not telling you that the, we saw what the post-Trump Republican Party looks like. Just go back and look at that speaker's race. This, this is not like, oh, thank God, Brent Scrocoff has come walk back through the door and everything <laughs> is going to be just like it was before. No. It's not. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, and uh, I, and I, again, I am, you know, and my Democratic friends and press friends out of panic, I said, don't worry, you're probably going to get something crazy. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. he, because Trump was good for business. I mean, and, and, you know, he kept everybody on cable TV. He, he, everybody had a column they could write. Everybody could start an organization. All right. And there's a lot of interest in keeping Trump around, but I don't think the voters want him around much more. And I think increasingly Republican voters would like to have somebody new and younger. Well, let's get to I mean, this. So you've really cut to the chase. I was going to spend a little longer on sort of the balance of power between the two parties and all this. But, but of course, so much, as you so well know, having uh, been with Bill Clinton in 92 is, is candidate dependent and presidential race dependent. Let's just cut right to that in, in each case. Let's begin with, let's begin with the Republicans, which then I really want to spend a little more time on the Democrats. But so why, I mean, okay, the obvious counter argument to you is tr- Trump's been counted out before. He's still kind of close to even in the polls with DeSantis. He'll get indicted, but he won't be convicted before probably election day or nominating day in 24. Uh, he still is a talented demagogue. I mean, why are you so confident he's he's done? Well, uh, he's really the polls I've seen. He's not even with DeSantis. DeSantis is pretty much ahead of him. And when you're the former president and you see that he's at CPAC, I match lap, uh, you see that 
he got like 54%. Well, they, you get 54% at CPAC and you're not going to do, that's not a good sign. And it's really not. And just if you ask Republicans, I hope Donald Trump runs or it's time for somebody else, because somebody else should get 62%. Yeah. Now, the, the danger, I have to acknowledge that there is a path that he could wreak havoc, and it is this. In, in the Democratic Party, our primaries are mostly proportional. All right? So if you get, you know, if you fall 60, you know, it falls 35, 32, 33, then you end up with 35, another guy gets 32, 33. The Republicans are mostly going to take off. So if you win 35, 33, 32, you end up with 35. All right? You get the whole ball of wax. You get 100%. So what a candidate with a deep, loyal, consistent base cause a lot of damage in a Republican nominating process? The answer is yes. But that's the only way, the only path that he would have. And that, that assumes that not a lot more is coming. And, you know, every, every, and those thing that the Republicans, even the far right people, electability is going to be a big freaking issue. OK, you can send the Sanders can say in a debate, you can you can renominate Trump. All right. And you lost in 18. You lost in 2020. You lost in 2022. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of losing. You know, all the Democrats want you. You can, you can the speech writes itself. All right. 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 It just writes itself. You don't have to to think to write that speech. And I, I just I, and I just don't see him being a, a big force. And that Olivia Newsy piece in New York magazine, if you haven't read it, you're not a good citizen. And, and it was well written. And, you know, I, it sure sounded true the whole way in the portrait that it print. It, I did not because I'm incapable of it. But if I were a better human being, I'd have felt sorry for Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's an interesting thought. Um, does he blow things up on his way out, though? Does he kind of gracefully endorse whoever the Republican nominee is and tell his people to vote for them? If he thought it would hurt the Republicans, he would. I don't think he he's not like the Republican like he used to be. All right. right. Yeah, that, because he doesn't want. Well, well, the Republican Party finally won an election after failing in 2018, 2020, and 2022 under the leadership of former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. The Republicans have once again captured the presidency. He don't want that at all. All right. Joe Biden is reelected. All right. And the Republicans didn't do well. And but one of the problems people point to, Charlie, is they didn't use Donald Trump enough. He wants that. that that's what he wants. You can't look at him like a normal politician because he's anything but a normal politician. It's all revenge. It's all grievance. It's all, uh, I'll get them back. How dare they? So he has a problem for the Republicans because either he wins the nomination and he is probably a weaker candidate than the others, or he loses the nomination and doesn't isn't a good team player. And I don't know how many people follow him and not being a good team player. It's such a polarized electorate. They Maybe they all end up voting for DeSantis or Haley or Tim Scott or whatever anyway, but um, but he could presumably cause some trouble on the way down, right? He, he could, but more likely he, his position continues to deteriorate. And when they indict him, so much of it is going to depend on the clarity of, of the charge uh, and, and what they are, but that's not going to help. I, you know, I was just saying, oh, it's it's it, it, not going to be like El Chapo where people like take the streets and start shooting up people. That, that, that's not going to happen again, I don't think. Uh, I, I guess, you know, I, I guess you have to acknowledge that he, he continued to be a, a, a serious menace to Republicans. But my guess is, is that his power is ebbing by the day. And my guess is it'll continue in that trajectory. But Interesting. Yeah, he, he he still has a lot of support that they have to pay attention to. But let's see, let's see. I'm skeptical he can keep it up. Yeah, that's so interesting. And presumably they can 
address some of the same issues, the same culture war stuff and all this. So, hey, well, you're good at this. So handicap the Republican leading candidates. Which ones are overestimated, underestimated? Any surprises out there? How much of a favorite is DeSantis? Right. I'd say DeSantis would be slightly overestimated. Underestimated, I'd say Brian Kemp. Interesting. I, I, I Now, I, I, I don't, uh, you know, you, Cruz, Cotton, Josh Hawley. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe. DeSantis is, he's out in front for a long time. And you know, in politics, the longer that you hanging out there, you start, people start to smell odors and everybody, and trust me, Cru, the Cruz, Hawley, Cotton, you know, tripartite pack, they don't, they, it, they don't like DeSantis. And who else can't stand DeSantis is Roger Stump. And the name that you're going to hear in the coming months is the name of Susie Wiles. Why are you going to hear the name of Susie Wiles? She was DeSantis's top person. It was like the most proficient. Her, her dad was, uh, God, he's like a big sports broadcast uh, guy. I can't think of it right now. And Mrs. DeSantis fired her, and she went to work for Trump. And Ms. Wiles knows a lot. So let's just keep our, our eye on her because, and, you know, when the way the Democrats play, there's nothing. The way that Roger Stone plays, <laughs> you know, and I, there, there's, there's a lot of people that, don't wish the Santos well, and a lot of them are just throwing banana peels on the ground and waiting them to step on one. That, that, that's what I think is the Santos's problem. And he's uh, unlike a, a, a Bill Clinton or even a, a George W. Bush. He, he, he doesn't. He's not a people person. He, he, and it's well documented, and that counts in politics, particularly if you're going to be out there for a long time and you know you have a lot of party leaders and things that you need for these primaries. That's a, that, that's a skill that he does not possess. But you don't have to be a hell of a fellow, a good old boy to be effective gov governance, but it, it does help. And he's no such thing. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, and I've heard that also about, about him. And it will be interesting. As, yeah, he hasn't really been tested yet in the sense of, having talented operatives on his side, trying to undercut him, you know, the stones and so forth. So Kemp, I mean, you're, that's interesting. So he's been a very successful, popular governor of Florida, reelected of uh, Georgia, reelected easily. While having stood up to Trump in 2020, do you think the party will be willing to go to someone who really stood up to Trump or is there an in-between, <laughs> you know, an in-between path for the Nikki Haley's, Glenn Youngkin's kind of never? Yeah, I think it would certainly give him he would be a little different in that sense. And he's got a, a pretty damn good story to tell. Yep. All right. Uh, in terms of Georgia and, you know, his conservative values and everything. I, I don't, you know, he, I, I'm just, I'm not saying that I think he's going to be a nominee, but you asked me for the underprice, you know, I'm, I'm going yeah. to the win, you know, eight to one horse. Okay. I'll take this one at eight to one. All right. That, yeah. That's kind of what it is, but any, he, he's a, uh, He's very presentable. I don't, that's a Southern word, okay? <laughs> it, I'm sure it's got some negative kind of, somebody at some college campus doesn't like it, but that, <laughs> he, you know, he, he makes a good impression. He takes a good shower. Any of the others that strike you, particularly Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, Chris Christie, I don't know, uh, governors, uh, well, other Chris governors? I, I, I like Governor Christie, you know, as you, I've done events with him. And he's very personable and everything. They're not going to nominate him. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, Haley is pretty gifted. Uh, Republicans love right wing blacks. That's, you know, you saw the guy in Florida, they put up the speaker. And it's, but somehow or another, they think that this, this uh, having said that, I don't know, it's kind of hard for me to see Tim Scott nudging in there, but. I, I certainly would. I wouldn't take him out of. I wouldn't say there's no way. I mean, he'd be a kind of top tier. I mean, some people that run for president and 
come on, you, what do you, they don't care. Like John Bolton actually announced the president in 2024 in, at the BBC, <laughs> okay? Let's so we're not, gonna, I, it, it, we're not gonna ask about John Bolton because we just both kind of statement it up. He's not gonna be the nominee. And you know, it, it, you have that level of kind of candidate of Dennis Kucinich, you know, right. people like that. But uh, Tim Scott is definitely not in that category at all. He's somewhere at the bottom of the top tier. My governor here in Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, are you impressed by his so political talent or just too hard to too early to tell? Or? Yeah, so far, so good, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the Republicans cannot win without what keeps them alive is this high turnout of non-traditional voters, all right? And we, they have a particular allegiance to Trump and they have a particular allegiance to not just mega policies, all right? But mega personality, own the lips, you know, like in your face kind of thing. and and. So far, I, from what I can see, that Youngkin has navigated that pretty good in, in Virginia. Uh, he would definitely, you would not throw him out. You wouldn't say that guy doesn't have a chance. Uh, you know, you would keep him, uh, when he announces, you, it'll, be, it'll get covered and people will take him seriously. Uh, but it's a, it's a long way from there to getting people who haven't traditionally voted, voted out to vote. That's what that's what Trump has done for the Republicans. Now, conversely, and I, I can't say this enough. We've gone through three cycles, and all three have had better than traditional youth share. In other words, the, in three cycles, the eighteen to thirty-five, they've made up a bigger share of the electorate than they normally do. They keep getting increasingly democratic. And the, the Republicans, that's all right. They'll, they'll go through that phase. And they'll, you know, if you don't have a, if you're young and you don't have a, if you're conservative, you don't have a heart. If you're old right. and you're liberal, you don't have a brain. And, and the people think that's actually true. It's actually not true. Right. It's political science is just absolute. Once you vote two times for a political party, that's it. You're done. I mean, there's been so much research on that. And that's You're done the, in the sense that you—that's the party you stick that's with. That's the party 90, you're going to vote for. Huge, yeah, yeah. A huge percentage you're of the time. You voted yeah, for yeah. somebody when you were 22, and you voted again for that party when you're 20. And when you're 26, at 66, you're going to be voting for the same party. Oh, I don't—I know my, my uncle, my nephew. Well, okay, your nephew, but that's a—that's a studied, settled thing in political science. It's not that hard to figure out. Uh, and then and, and you're starting to see some of the commentators are starting to figure this out. And so I, I think if the Democrats can have a good 2024, which is possible, they'll, they'll do even better in 28. Let me come back to the Democrats in a second, but just one last word on the Republican presidential side of things. I suppose if Trump really fades and maybe doesn't run, there is room for one or two you know, tr real Trump, can Trump candidates, like literally like Donald Jr. or Trumpy candidates like, I don't know, Carrie Lake or Marjorie Taylor Greene or Tucker Carlson. I mean, someone will take that lane, right? But presumably, yeah. 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 And, and we'll cause damage. Yeah. And it, it, and it all depends that that, that that candidate to do well, and this is eminently possible, let's just say Tucker, who we both know well, does it I could see him getting those non-traditional rural small town voters out who don't normally vote voting in these primaries. And he, he would offer them something uh, in, a, in a creative and forceful way. But, but yes, it's Trumpism. But Kathy Barnett, who was, if you don't remember her, she was the black Republican that ran as the Trumpy candidate in the Pennsylvania Senate. Right, primary. who came from nowhere and ended up and pretty she close. Said, she had the smartest analysis that I've ever heard. She said, you got to understand, MAGA was here before Trump. He came in and did what we wanted him to do, and we voted for him. And somebody pointed out, yeah, you know, he went to North Alabama and told people to get vaccinated. 
<laughs> that booed him off the stage. He, Trump has rented MAGA. All right. This kind of nativism and, and God knows what else I would call it existed before him. He certainly articulated, but he only did that because he did what they wanted him to do. If he tried to do something they didn't want to do, they didn't pay attention to it. So, and it is a, it, it's a big part of the Republican Party and it can get non-traditional voters to vote, which is the thing that the Republicans need. So, and if, if it's Glenn Youngkin, I don't know if Glenn Youngkin has the political skill, frankly, I don't know if very many people do, to kind of keep the Northern Virginia suburbs and, you know, Henrico and Chesterfield in check to acceptable losses by getting sky high turnout in Rockingham and Shenandoah. You know, you know what I'm saying. That, that's, a, that's a pretty delicate feat. <clears throat> Yep, it would take someone very skilled to pull off in a presidential race. I think when we last spoke uh, on this conversation in, in April of 2021, 20, it was unclear how much election denialism would sort of remain strong in the Republican Party, how unclear uh, how, well, just what you've been talking about, how strong Trumpism really was. I mean, he obviously was kind of uniquely able to amplify it and and uh, multi, you know, extend it beyond the Pat Buchanan kind of Ron Paul level. But um Aren't you, are you struck today? I mean, I guess I am. Well, let's just talk about the party for a minute as opposed to the candidates. Uh, the the degree of to which the party has moved more in that direction, not less, despite everything, don't you think? I mean, the actual real existing Republican Party in the Senate, in the House, in the governorships is more Trumpy or Trumpist than it was before the, before the election and certainly than it was three or six, five years ago uh than not right i mean you know the the ones who resisted are gone mostly and the new ones are are not on the kind of glenn youngkin side even they're on the kind much more as we saw in the house speaker uh, race it's not a bunch of old people who are the MAGA people it's the younger uh, newer elected republicans yeah it, it, it's true i mean how could you call anything worse than blake masters i have no idea all right <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually from Box, a guy who didn't think we should have fought World War II. I thought we'd have agreed on that a long time ago that the war, but but the younger voters are not with. Them. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's yeah. The election deniers are overwhelmingly older. Yeah. And, and of course they 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 dig in because that's if if I talk to someone in rural Georgia, you really don't think they're cheating in Atlanta. Come on, James, you know, it just stuff the hell hell can just how many votes you need, that's how many votes you get. That's a bit in if I'm in downstate Illinois, you you think that stuff that you get out of Cook County is any good? You know, you, you the, the idea that you say, no, actually, people have studied this and there's hardly any fraud at all. It, they, they, they don't even penetrate. All right. It 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 just became part of the myth of political America that there's widespread cheating in urban America. And I'm sure it was true to some extent. I doubt if it's maybe it's one percent true or two percent, but that's about it. But it, it's it's so ingrained that the only way somebody is going to lose this is that they pass to another world, but they, they're not going to change their mind. Yeah, it's so interesting. As you say, the voters are the older voters, the people who, the opportunistic younger politicians who've seen a chance to yeah. you know rise very fast, the Elise Stefanics and Marjorie Taylor Greene. And we can make fun of Marjorie Taylor Greene, but she's much more powerful than she would be if she had just been an old-fashioned, normal, dutiful you know, Republican working on her committees. I mean, those people really took advantage of it. And I guess I'm just struck how extreme, I think people are underestimating a little the re, what the Republican Party is going to look like over the next two years. And maybe I'm wrong, but do you think the House Republicans could hurt the Republican, you know, hurt going into 24, neutral? Uh, I, no. I'm like everybody else. I wait to see a poll taken, you know, but maybe this weekend, uh, later this week on favorability of the parties. I, it, do I think that just hurt them? It, it, it couldn't have helped. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not a Republican, but if, I, if the Democrats did that, I'd, I'd be under the covers. I wouldn't. I couldn't look at television. I mean, it'd be too much to, to contemplate. Um, 
I think some of this is going to see yeah. through. I really yeah. do. Yeah, interesting. Well, so it'll be, so that's the Republican side, I guess. Um, Democrats, you mentioned President Biden, but it's, uh, let's just talk about it from the, uh, in terms of the party as a whole. And, but what about, I mean, do you think really, uh, I, I'm just predictions, as you right. said, are difficult. Will Joe Biden run? And will he, if he does run, I suppose he'll be the nominee. So it's really just a question of whether he'll run uh, in 24. Well, right now it's pretty clear that he intends to run, but you know, nothing, you can always change your mind. And I, I think the age issue is going to be huge. All right. It, 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 I'll point out that, that Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Jim Clyburn all resign their post. All of them are younger than Biden would be at the end of his second term. Probably younger than mid second term. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I say I, I just got the latest census numbers on my computer, and as of this moment, there are thirty-three million three hundred and sixty-one thousand four hundred and eleven people that live in the United States. Could we please find somebody under seventy-five to be our president? Just, just <laughs> put the point of it, <laughs> okay? We can try yeah. that. It, it is to get. You know, you've done enough of these to know that you know some lines are just going to work. That's the one that I know is going to work every time. And just, I mean, and I think President Biden, people, I've sort of made the case that he shouldn't run it again. He should be a very successful one-term president, which is a, will have made a great contribution to the country and so forth. And they said, well, he's the only one who could beat Trump or has beaten Trump. But I, I suppose if Trump fades, as you're saying you think he is, doesn't that lessen the case for Biden? I mean, for the, on the reasons you're, if you have a younger Republican running against Biden, then that argument you just made, that comment you just made, makes a bit of a difference now. Okay. I, I guess what I would do, I, I, I would not, I don't, why is he the only Democrat to beat Trump? I have no well, idea. Okay. Well, that too. I mean, I agree with that too. And so, yeah, yeah. He, he might have been the only Democrat that could beat Trump in 2020 because these people were not known. And frankly, most of them were not skillful and they had what I think is an idiotic strategy where they were chasing Bernie's left tail all around. I mean, look, Elizabeth Warren was a viable candidate until she came out for Medicare for all. Now, it's not that Iowa Democrats don't like Medicare for all. It's that they think it's a losing issue. Winnability is a much bigger issue now than it was when you and I were actually doing politics. But let, let's look at some of the Democratic candidates. Okay. Harris, and she's not going to chase anybody off, but she's a sitting vice president. She should obviously be a, a top tier candidate, as would Gavin Newsom. All right. Uh, I mean, he might not culturally be your cup of tea, but it, people don't realize this. The California economy is one of the best in the country. I mean, they look at their, their GDP growth. It's, it's, you know, Jay Inslee, Jared Poulos, uh, Amy Klobuchar. I'll give you one that, that, that I would look at real close, J.B. Pritzker, all right? Uh, Gretchen Whitmer, not big Gretch. I mean, probably the most successful Democratic state anywhere in the country. I mean, she has a hell of a story to tell. You know, and on this Biden beating Trump thing, I mean, I've always thought that Whitmer, Shapiro in Pennsylvania too, are a good response because fine, he beat Trump, that's great. He beat Trump in Michigan, Pennsylvania, yeah. Wisconsin, but Whitmer beat, her Trumpy opponent in in Michigan by a much bigger margin than Biden Absolutely. did, and Shapiro and Shapiro in Pennsylvania. So the idea that Whitmer and Shapiro can't win a national election, I just think empirically they just won in by big margins in the classic swing states, right? I mean, it's a, absolutely. I'll give you a couple other names. All right, Roy Cooper. Yeah. All right, Mitch Lanza. All right. I mean, his former lieutenant governor, was mayor, was president of the U.S. Congress of Mayors, and in, in the Biden cabinet. By the way, in the single most important voting bloc in determining Democratic president, by far, not close, African Americans, so particularly in the South. You know how much street cred Mitch has in a South Carolina church? I can tell you a lot. Interesting. I, I mean, Warnock is skilled enough. Right. That, 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 that the party, that, that my point is, is that. They, they want you to believe that without Biden, there's nothing underneath. The, the fact is, there's a, 
as much as I've seen any party have at any given time, <clears throat> uh, the talent that that's, you know, and, and, and if all of these people ran, which I would encourage every one of them to do, people look and they go, oh, you know what? These people can string a sentence together. Uh, you know, I mean, I think it would be good for the party. And I, I just think that it's me being 78, it's, you know, people say, why don't you go run this cafe? I said, well, the only thing I can run in my life is my mouth. But go get somebody else. But I'm I'm with you on that too. But for me, but I'm also with you on uh, on the quality of the Democratic bench and and the you know case for letting them run. Uh, just as there was a case for letting Nancy Pelosi, who's been a skilled right. speaker, uh, step down for Hakeem Jeffries, and I think that's going to end up working out fine for the for the yeah. Democrats. But but the sophisticated answer to what you've been I've been saying and what you just said very well is, well, that's very nice for you to say in theory, but in practice, we saw what 2019, 2020 looked like. And you just said it was kind of a ridiculous, the, the debates were not great. And it was oh. everyone ran to the left. And why won't that just happen again? I, I don't think it will for several reasons. No one is they saw what happened in 2020. And somebody is going to stand up in a meeting and say, just so you know, do, do we really want to be Elizabeth Warren here? Yeah. All right. And it, it, there might be, and again, it wasn't that people in Iowa disliked the concept of Medicare for all. They were just convinced it was a general election loser. And, and uh, I, you know, some of them will. I, I, somebody remember Alan Cranston, he ran like in 1984 or something like right, that. Right. You know, somebody's going to say, look, if we get you know, the identity crowd, that's that we can get, you know, that'll pull out at 27% and that's somewhere. Okay. And, and yes, but th that space will be occupied. I just don't think it's going to be occupied by a lot of candidates. And I don't think it's going to be occupied by the winning candidate if there's kind of an, op an open primary. And I, I, I don't think that Harris's status as a vice president or a, a woman of color is going to be determinative at all. I mean, she may, I mean, certainly she's going to get a very close listen. People pay attention to her, but she's, she's got to make a case here. She has that, that she has not made that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, and do you think, I mean, I guess, does someone have to say what you've been saying and I've been saying in my very little way, uh, someone who's an actual elected official have the nerve to say, with all due respect, Mr. President, you've done a great job. You, you will go down in history as an important American president, but one term is enough. Or did, can he just come to that on his own? Or, I mean, how, how does it work in practice? Look at the Senate map. I, I, it pains me to look at it because from the standpoint of a Democrat, it is off, all right? So everyone, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, everywhere that you can think of, all right? Montana. West Virginia. West Virginia, all right? It's going to, every poll is going to say, ask, do you want President Biden to run for election? And every mm -hmm. poll is going to come back like they all come back. No. And the way this might happen is about five vulnerable Democratic senators ask for a meeting and say, sir, this is, you know, we can run on your accomplishment, anything like that. I mean, the, the, believe you me, everybody that counts knows exactly what this Senate map is. Everybody that counts knows that we got to have a really enthusiastic group of group to go out and vote, and, you know, got to build on this young thing. And you just have 65% of the people in the country that don't want him to run for re-election. And it's not something like you can change your position on. Okay, I used to be against gay marriage. Now I'm for gay marriage. All right. Okay, great. All right. You can't change your age. It's a fixed number. And it doesn't do anything but go up. It's not going to get better. And, you know, if you're these, or, you know, you're, you're, you're Democratic House members. And, you know, people come back and they go see the DCCC. And they said, man, if we had a, you know, if, if, our presidential performance number went to this, we could pick up these seats. And, it's, and again, it's not that 
Democrats like back. They, they give great credit for what he's been able to do with, with very narrow majorities. But they're like everybody else. It, you know, now if he runs, he'll win. And, uh, you know, and he's got to think about what he wants to do at Harris. You know, it, it, when you elect a 82-year-old president, the vice president is pretty goddamn relevant at that point. So I, I don't know. But I do know that all of this is not going away. I mean, sometimes he gets irritated when he gets asked about it. Like, they're, they're not going to not ask it. Yeah. You know, and I can't blame them. And I think your key insight sort of implied here is that uh, President Biden can announce he's running for re-election. They can set up the committee on February 1st or whatever, uh, or people can announce on his behalf that he intends to run. But that's not going to stop it either, right? It doesn't change, as you said, the age question. And it doesn't change people saying, wait a second, sir, both the argument you just made politically, but also I think a serious argument that there's a ton you can do for the country over these next two years, probably even easier to do it if you're not a candidate foreign policy ukraine iran some of the getting making sure we get past the inflation and COVID. i mean is a real agenda here which right. would really mark give you a mark in the history books harder to do that if you're a candidate so you're, you're right and, and you know if you look at some of the stuff he's done I, I could argue i think pretty good that ukraine is probably the most successful foreign policy initiative since world war ii hmm. i mean you couldn't ask for, for you know <clears throat> exposing your, your biggest adversary <clears throat> without losing a single person right i i, I mean I, I can't imagine that it is not in in the real interest of the united states and the west to not keep this thing going all right and, and and Biden can take a lot of credit for it. And he can take a lot of credit as, you know, everybody said the Europeans would, you know, oh, they're going to be typical, you know, that they, they, they've held together pretty good. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, it's been been kind of been impressive, if you will. So that not, not many presidents get that kind of a, a, a foreign policy achievement. But, you know, like, let me tell you how you know that they're a little bit uncomfortable. Why did they try to move South Carolina ahead of New Hampshire? Yeah, okay. You know the real inside stuff. So tell me about well, that. I'm I mean, curious. First of all, the South, Carolina, South Carolina already determined who the president was. It, Clinton lost New Hampshire. Obama lost New Hampshire. Biden lost New Hampshire. You know, Biden and, got crushed in New Hampshire. Yeah, it was fifth, uh, right, I think. <laughs> yeah, but they acquired the name of president, right? And there was no reason to change that. There were a lot of reasons not to. First of all, you got two Democratic senators, two Democratic Congress people, and it's actually a swing state. Right. It's not Vermont. Right? So you're going to... In But what they... And I, South I, Carolina I, is not a swing state. Sure, yeah. but I, th th this is informed speculation. We're going to draw... Somebody's going to run against us. And you know what happens in New Hampshire? It, same thing happened to Lyndon Johnson. So thing thing happened either they got it, it, and they're going to get started because it's quirky the, the other side can come in it's quirky we don't need quirkiness we need stability so let's move to south carolina because you know and they know that you get a decent candidate and you're going to get a lot of votes in new hampshire you so, said you know south carolina is going to be much more predictable and i think that's a pretty evident sign that they tried to do this, which, you know, politically doesn't make any sense. I'm, I'm sure that he's, uh, you know, the Black Caucus put a lot of pressure on him. But uh, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is Black, Southern Blacks in particular are already the dominant force by far in nominating Democratic presidents. That's why, I mean, you, you look at a potential Democratic candidate ask yourself how are they going to do in the mississippi delta and you say well on that gavin newsom i'm not too sure yeah all right in that because without that you're not going anywhere and presumably that's buddha judge's challenge and he's a very otherwise yeah, a very that, talented candidate very i think talented, yeah. but uh, you know he, he had trouble with what with, with, with black voters in in when he ran in 2020 so it, it, that's the, that's the most key. And by the way, 
they're not particularly left. Uh, James Clyburn always said the most conservative person I ever knew was my daddy. Mm -hmm. And they don't, shiny new objects do not appeal to them. All right. That, that's not, that's not what it, that, that, they, they, they like somebody dependable. That's why I give, if he doesn't run, I give my friend Mitch Lantro a, a real shot because that is the most important constituency in the party. Uh, but New Hampshire is much more volatile. And then once something happens, it, it, it cascades them. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't go on a straight line. And if I'm political people are very smart and very experienced and they saw this coming and they went about it to fix it. Yeah. That's so interesting. That hasn't been commented on that much in the news. A lot of, you know, they're rewarding their supporters in South Carolina, which is fine and probably true to some degree, but yeah, the, the worrying about the Gene McCarthy kind of uh, Pat Buchanan phenomenon in New Hampshire is, uh, that's a very good point, I, I, I think. And, but it does, show, yeah, it's a, it, putting it together with your earlier point, it, it's a good reminder. People are treating it as if, well, Biden announces, as I said earlier, on February 1st, or the committees get set up, and that's like all the talk is over. But of course, that's not how it's going to work, you know? I mean, people, and and he'll announce, then there'll be, as you say, polling, and stuff will happen. And and maybe some one of these people, one of the ones who's wealthy, the Pritzkers or the Newsoms of the world, will decide, you know what, I might just start talking about considering a race, much as I love and respect Joe Biden. I mean, I do think the dynamic of 2023 on the Democratic presidential side is underrated. People are used to incumbents who, you know, Bush, Clinton, or whatever, they run for re-election, they run for re-election. And basically, there's not much of a story, uh, you know, Obama to, to write about then. If J.D. Pritzker said, James, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to give you a million dollars, which you can afford easily, for the best advice you can give me, I said, my advice, Governor, is carry a gold watch around and said, this is what President Biden deserves. He has really, really served our party. He has served our nation with distinction for, I don't know, 70, 65 years. Anything like that, you know? And I would just have I, the gold watch would be my prop. <laughs> there you go, mm -hmm. Governor Chris. I'm giving you this, and you don't even have to pay me a million dollars. <laughs> That's good. But you, yeah, I mean, you can find me in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> when Governor Fritzker watches this, he'll be the check will be in the mail, you know. But yeah. um the uh I mean just, just whether one of them has the nerve to do it, but a lot will depend, as you say, on polling and other things that happen. And it's a long, it's a long time. Let me close. Uh, this has been very interesting in so many ways. Um, what about the De Democrats do control the Senate? They they have a large number of uh large representation of the House and the ability to make uh Make some news there too. What would your advice be to to Schumer and to and to and to Hakeem Jeffries in the sense of what's the best thing they can do for the party over the next over the next couple of years? Well, it, it, to Hakeem Jeffries is you know just keep supplying them rope. Yeah, I mean, in the supply of rope. I mean, if you did, and what what you do is not going to be very much. It's less important than than the stuff that they come up with. Like in the Senate, that, that you have legislative strategies to, to focus something home. So Kevin McCarthy has said that he wants to get this. He wants to have used the debt limit to force cuts in Social Security and Medicare. I would put an amendment up and have the Republicans in the Senate vote on that. Right. I, in every kind of cockamamie idea that they came up with, if I were a Democratic senator, I would offer that as an amendment because the Republican senator is going to look like they're disloyal, they don't go along with it. The public thinks it's utterly, that there couldn't be a worse idea than defaulting on a debt or, or shutting the government down to do the most two most unpopular things that you can do in American politics. Uh, so I, that would be certainly part of my strategy and pass things and I go to my poster and say, what are the five most popular things that we could do? And then do them all and let the house kill it. Right. I, I mean, you know, people say, well, well, why vote on this? It's not going to pass the house. That's exactly the reason to vote on it. All right. They don't want to vote. They don't want to have a vote on raising the minimum wage. Now you say, let's say 74% popularity. Uh, 
I mean, just I'd, I'd have my poster. Dude. What's the five most popular things we could do? And I'd go out and do it and send them over to the house. Let them kill it and say, aha, who told you? You know, people like immigration. You can't confuse immigration and the border. They don't like to saw it on the border, but they like immigration. And, and by the way, it, it, this is one tight labor market. There's only one way. There, there are two things that you can do that would loosen up the labor market. One is immigration, and two is daycare. If, if you had good federally funded daycare, if, if, if I were a McDonald's franchisee, I would be happy to pay more taxes to support that because I'd come out way better on, on, a, on if you want to increase labor force participation, don't give mothers a choice between child care and, and, and a job. Ma'am, we got you covered for eight hours a day. All right. That that would work brilliantly. And if you know, you hear this all the time, particularly, you know, from a lot of my uh, conservative business people, ain't nobody wants to work in this country anymore. God damn it, James. It's just there are more people working in the United States right now than time in history. What are you talking about? There are a lot of immigrants who would like to work. That's for it, sure. It, it's so you're a 28-year-old mother with a 12 year old and a six year old child in, in Honduras, and you walk to the Mexican border, you're motivated. Okay, we got a place for you, lady. Come on in. All right, that's a motivated person. She Do you think the Democrats walking. have been too spooked by that issue? I mean, to the, Biden seems to be just have been at least so far wary of doing anything uh, because they'll just get back to the border yeah. and the Republicans will demagogue it. Yeah, it, there's part of the Democratic Party. That, you know, and, and that doesn't think that we should even have a border or have border enforcement. That, that's, but you know who else used to say essentially the same thing? The Wall Street Girl on the toilet page. Right. All right. That's always been pe people do not like disorder. Plain and clear. They like immigration. They like immigrants. They don't like disorder. Now, it's almost in, in one of the reasons I did a Jim Acosta yesterday, and I said, you want to blame Joe Biden for something that on immigration? I'll give something. He created too goddamn many jobs. <laughs> if, if we wouldn't have a hot job market, we'd have a lot less people. Now, ask yourself, do you want to live in a country that people are clamoring to get into or a country that people are clamoring to get out of? I, me, I'm happy I live here, not Venezuela. I'll be honest with you. I, I consider it a blessing. <laughs> if I lived in Venezuela, I would want to live here. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Final uh, thing. I, when we talked in April of 21, you were concerned about the identity politics stuff and spilling over, I think you said, from the Amherst Faculty Lounge to the Democratic Party and uh, creating a certain image of the party, partly fairly, partly unfairly. Do you feel like that's receded a bit? Does the party d address that? Is it sort of where it was a couple of years ago? How worried are you about all that stuff? I, I think it has receded some. And there's just not an honorable way for it to recede even more. So when, when I started this, people were coming up. You know, at the time that we talked in spring of 2021, I guess it was. Yeah. And it said, you say some controversial shit, James. I said, no, I don't. 85% of the people agree with me. You're not saying anything controversial. That 85% agree with what you're saying. And the truth of the matter is, they never, they didn't never fool me because I didn't have anything to cancel. What is they're gonna have to cancel me from the bulwark? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Not, they, they, there's nothing I don't worry. They, they can't cancel me from LSU because I don't work there anymore. They can, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uncancelable. But yes, I think it, it's receding, and I think people understand that it's bad politics. Yeah, I, I do. I, I think it reached its zenith and, you know, sometimes in 2020, you know, but I, I think I think it's receded. I, I just don't think anybody's going to come up and say we were just wrong with this obsessive focus on language and we'll stop it. It's not going to do, but it, it they in somebody will embrace that but they're not going to do very well. The, the New York Times, it, it, by most accounts, it's generously 
15 percent of the Democratic Party. I, I mean, the number of people, a number of Republicans who, who believe the earth is younger than 5,000 years old are significantly higher than a number of Democrats that embrace identity politics language and by a long shot. All right. But there are some that that is correct. And, uh, you know, maybe some of it is is uncalled for. I'll tell you a word that I don't use anymore. Well, I'll use it now, but I, I, try, I try not to use is the word woke. And, right. and let me why. Yes, yeah, say a word about that. The, the best history says that the word woke was first used by a guy named Lead Belly Ledbetter, right. who was the staggeringly talented, innovative jazz musician who was born <clears throat> in Cattle Parish, right outside of Shreveport. I think he died in a Houston jail. And he wrote, he, he wrote a song, and it basically said that Black people had to be woke when dealing with policemen, which was probably a pretty good idea in 1920s America. That, you know, you should, as a saying in the Marine Corps, you should have situational awareness. Right. <laughs> right? And I think the word has a real noble and meaningful history. And like everything else, some overeducated coastal white person decided that they were going to screw it up for everybody and they've diminished the, the real meaning of the word and what it should mean is there's just something another piece of academic jargon that you can just swing around so that that's why i'm i'm too high on the word woke to even use it anymore i, I think it's just, uh, close to a sacrilege so i i just call it the identity left of, the identity academic left or something like that. I and mean, people know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they do. And I, and, and I have a sense too, that it's receded, but we'll see. We'll see yeah. over the next year or two. That'll be a big one. One of the big. It unknowns. hadn't gotten big that I'm sure. It's still there, but my, my, my real sense is it, it, it's receded, you know? Yeah. More. And even if it is only 15, I'm just struck the Republicans. This is partly a Republican talking point in Fox news success story that they made Lots of people out there think it was a bigger part of the Democratic Party than it ever was. But the Democrats played into it at times, too, obviously. So the question is how much they can push back and really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and Biden has been very helpful in that because he doesn't even know what woke is. He says, what, what, what you talking about, pal? Well, you see, sir, I don't understand. Tell me, no, he, I mean, he has no idea. Uh, uh, the language of the identity left. I mean, it's just you kind of look at. Joe Biden, and it's just hard to see the word Latinx come out of his mouth. <laughs> so there could be people in his administration, but whatever. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. So, yeah. Now, the degree to which, I mean, just to loop back to what we're talking about, I, I don't know, I just feel like people are, the degree to which Biden could really go down as successful and important one-term president and running for re-election, a second term with the age, but with also the other things that happen in second terms that you and I have seen so many times. The idea that's in his interest to run for a second term, I find I, the, the fact that all of his people seem to believe that I'm a little mystified by that. I just feel like if you're being honest, just just thinking about him, leave aside the country, leave aside the party, leave aside all the other stuff that he should also, and of course does also think about. I am sort of amazed that they all think, of course he should run. It's it's the right thing for him to do. It's like, really, why is that? Yeah, first of all, when you are for a president, everything that they say they're gonna do is brilliant, all right? and. You know, he has done a good job. I'm always reminded of when De Gaulle said he wasn't going to run for President of France again. And they said, my God, what's, what's France going to do without you? He said, the graveyards are full of indispensable people. All right. There, there's no such thing. Maybe they've talked themselves into believing that they're indispensable to the future of the United States. Well, and, and you know, you experienced it. We both experienced it in being a, a much better way than, than you did. How could we ever have a president that was not a veteran of World War II? Well, things change. How could we ever have a, a president that's black? Well, things change. You know, um, I, I there's not you know again, there's nothing in, inevitable out there. And I, I look if, like I say, if he runs, yeah, he certainly deserves the nomination. He would get my vote, but I. I deep down inside uh i hope he gives this thing a lot more thought 
I'll leave it at that. That's a very good judicious note on which to, <laughs> to end. And, uh, and I think you've been controversial in your own way, even though you, you claim not to be controversial, but <laughs> I trust you won't be canceled because of this conversation. James, thank you really very much for, for taking well, this time. It's been very thank, interesting. Thank you, Bill. And as I pointed out, <clears throat> the people that support your group are actually the people that did play probably the biggest part in this election. I mean, it, it, it just it just can't be denied. <clears throat> and I hope that the Democrats make people like that comfortable in our coalition. You're, you're never going to be comfortable with Democrats because we're coalition and our coalition partners, some of them you, you like more than others. But that's the nature of a party that is a, is a coalition, which I think that we need more coalitions in this country. I don't think it's a bad word at all. I think it's a good word. So for now, at least, welcome to the coalition. <laughs> I, thank you. And it's, uh, it's good to be it's good to be part of it, honestly. Uh, thank you, James. And thank you all for joining us on Conversations.